Welcome, everybody. Um, we're delighted to be joined by four really experienced, uh, knowledgeable uh, colleagues, friends, history heads of history um, who we've worked with for a number of years. Um, we're being joined by Nathaniel Arnott Davis, who's just joined um, Harris Invictus in South London, uh, Estelle Cooch, who's been at Haberdasher's Hatcham in South East London for quite some time now. Um, Otis Blaze, who's just joined Harris Purley um, this year, this academic year. Um, and Sharon Ananakwa, who is now um, assistant head teacher at St. Claudine's Catholic School for Girls in Harlesden. So our friends and colleagues are going to join us to talk about our new book, um, it's coming from the printers. It's been a bit delayed. It's coming from the printers next week, I understand, the 21st. But our friends have been able to access a copy of it in advance. So they're going to be talking to you about certain key questions in relation to black teaching Black British history in relation to the book. Um, Abdul, do you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. Hi. Um... <laughs> um, and Abdul's going to be... Uh, just kind of listening into the to the talk and occasionally sharing pages from the book um, when when it's relevant. So you might suddenly see the screen, the share screen come up, and he shows you um, some pictures of the book. Okay. Um, so we've got five questions. You've seen them already, many of you on Twitter and on your invitations. So we're going to kick off with the first question, which talks about the the general purpose of teaching this kind of history and perhaps why do we have this textbook in the first place? Why is this book, why has this book come out? And the question is, what is the historical significance of black lives in Britain since the 16th century? Um, and Nathaniel and Sharon are gonna talk to us about that. Uh, Sharon, you wanna kick us off? Okay, starting with me. Um, I think for me, and I think, you know, looking at the book and having the chance to have a preview of it, what I got a sense of is that the story of Black Britain is the story of Britain. And I think since the 16th century and possibly even before, you get a really, through the book and just generally through the lens of Black British history, you also get a really comprehensive overview of Britain in this time and I think that's probably you know a theme that we're going to come back to throughout this this webinar that yes this is black British British history but it's so intricately connected with the nation's story at large so I think for me you know the story of black British history is the story of British history and that's what makes it so significant and that's what makes it all the more um I guess strange that for a long time it's been left out of the national story or for such a long time it's been like an addendum to the national story and now we're kind of getting to a point now where we're seeing that this is actually an integral part of British history so yeah. Nathaniel? Yeah, I, yeah sorry to build on that I, I, I totally agree with Sharon and I think that word addendum is, is an interesting word because for me that has always been my experience of seeing black history or Black British history in the classroom is it's been an addendum, it's potentially been an additional lesson or maybe a, a nice anecdote here. Um, but what this book does, and I think why I, you know, I'm not being paid to say this, I'm genuinely very excited about this book, is that um, it puts it front and centre and it puts it front and centre in a way that isn't exceptionalist. It doesn't tell a story that says that these people that in, in this textbook have a story that, um, you know, that is special and therefore beyond any other um, any any other stories that we are trying to tell. It's part of, I think, a wider and I think a deeper picture of of the story of Britain. And I actually think also not only does it put Black British people within the centre of British history, but it also puts Britain within the context of global history. And I really, what I really like about these stories and the ways in which this textbook has been put together, and also I think in general the way in which we can teach Black lives in Britain is that it, it both, it does this double movement. It both allows us to center groups that have been marginalized 
in the story of Britain, but it also allows us to decenter Britain within the story of the world, or at least see Britain within the context of a global um, movement of people. So I think um, this, this, yeah, teaching of black history is about teaching British history properly, but it's also about teaching Britain's place in the world properly as well. Do you think, do you think teachers will be surprised by some of the stories? Yeah, I mean, uh, as someone who myself finds these things particularly interesting and and reads a lot around them there's stories in here that i don't know um and there's stories in here that i don't know that are told in ways that i would love to be telling in the classroom um so it, it's not just the stayed old stories of um the figures that will turn up again and again um over the last 10 years these are new stories um of people um that you may not be familiar with but i think students will definitely want to engage with i don't know if you agree sharon yeah totally and I think you know what you said about just how relatable a lot of these characters are yeah just the way in which they're written about in this book just humanizes them in ways that you don't often see so often you know um when we do talk about black British figures or historical figures they're kind of like you know, almost romanticized they're almost perfect they're mm -hmm they're seen as heroes and yeah that, that's part of the story as well but also just the ordinary everyday details that you've put in some of the I don't know if that was intentional you know but just some of the the background to some of the their stories and just the ordinariness about it you know I thought Any, that was anybody strike you not not wanting to put you on the spot but did anybody strike you like that uh, like Mallory Blackman you know, okay. when you wrote about the impact of her parents um, getting divorced at 13, that's just something young people from any walk of life are going to be able to connect with. And just just, just the, the, the humanity that is kind of afforded these people that, yes, they're exceptional. And, you know, she's in that, that, that chapter about black excellence, but she's also just a, 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 has, a, have, has had a very normal life and has lived real experiences and just humanizes black people i think sometimes there's the two extremes they're either completely dehumanized or they're kind of these exceptional heroes that you can't even really relate to but i think what what you kind of see and what is exciting and is surprising in the book is that these are real people you know even though that some of them have achieved exceptional things they've had very ordinary lives and in the, in, at the same time which i thought was just really intriguing I, I particularly liked um, William Cuffey, um, partly because I think it's it's a, it's an example of, of a black person turning up in a story that isn't traditionally taught as black history, right? The story of the charters, uh, sorry, the chartists. But I also like the, the the detail of Kennington Common and the fact that you know he's really annoyed with the other chartists and some of them for for, for deciding not to march and. Uh, I think that speaks exactly to what Sharon's saying of of that kind of humanizing and and yeah, giving agency to these people, not as figures of stories that maybe our students would have already maybe not seen, but have already imbibed with general kind of narratives that they will have before entering the classroom of of a black British person as either a hero or a victim or you know a martyr, and actually just as human beings in these stories instead. Um, and I, I particularly like that detail, and I like. Cuffy and Davidson turning up in these um, these periods of history that maybe would have been taught previously in schools, but now could be taught in a far more inclusive and I'd say a far more detailed and better way. Thank you. Um, next question, Abdul. Um, uh, so this one is to Nathaniel Notice. Um, so um, I think Nathaniel, you were touching on the, you know the fact that a lot of Black British history uh, in the past has been taught in a, through a certain prism, uh, and that hasn't always been helpful. Um, but a question that I think is on a lot of people's minds is: to what extent is Black British history uh, a story of a fight or fight uh, struggles against injustice? Mm -hmm. Um, so, and Otis or Nathaniel, I mean, either of you can kick off on that. I'm happy to kick off. Um, yeah. I think just building on that point, yeah, this is this is maybe one of the 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 great things about this book that that it will allow us to do is to tell stories of fighting for justice, but also to tell stories beyond that, um, and to tell stories that sit alongside those stories or maybe have no relevance to the question directly of justice, but actually have relevance to other. Um, other aspects of British history. I mean, there is no question that being black in British history 
has meant logically that there will be times where the fight for justice becomes a central part of their lives but um it's about so much more than that and yeah i think this textbook gives you the opportunity to to not just tell students that but to show them that um i don't know what you think otis yeah no i'd echo that as well i think with the idea of fighting for justice i think sometimes we can get too bogged down in that element of every story has some element of justice behind it um and for some part, the, the individuals in the textbook do have aspects where they do have, have to fight for justice, even if they are the exceptional character or the exceptional individual. Um, you see it, for example, in the later period when you're looking at sports players, for example, like John Barnes and things like that, it's they have that element of justice and as they're, they are at the top of kind of like the pinnacle of their profession, yet they still have to go through that kind of struggle. Um, and it just makes me think of the the wider kind of societal things of the struggle is ongoing. The, the fight for justice is something that, that has so much resonance to black people in Britain and just Britain in general. Um, these stories just aren't relegated to black people. They connect often with many, many different walks of people from different walks of life. Um, and I think so many different case stories in the book are ways in which to kind of really immerse students into what Britain has been like for hundreds and hundreds of years and that it reasserts kind of this idea of what what would we even mean by being British and especially when we're thinking about black history in, it, in itself this 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 constant theme of justice does play its part in in many of the different stories. Mm. I mean even going to the, one of the first inquiries in the textbook is about um, how it or how some black people were able to become celebrities in Georgian, Georgian England and I think I like the framing of that because it 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 places these individuals and the individuals are Equiano, Caguano and uh, Sabiz, but it places them all in, yeah, the quest, some of them are in a question of justice, but also just as humans that have become very well known and and asking questions about how they dealt with that and, and what that meant for them in the Georgian period. You know that's quite human I, I can imagine my year sevens or eights really considering what that means because that's something that you know touches their lives as well ideas of celebrity or or or, or fame and I think um that that one for for me that inquiry feels um one that I can't I, I would love to just get get started on in a classroom I think I think as well with the with the latter part of the book with the idea of Caribbean migration to Britain in the 20th century. I think that's a, an element as well where many of our students can connect with those stories where people have migrated, they've moved countries or they've moved to a different area and they've, they've had these hopes and aspirations of setting up a new life in Britain. And for all purposes, they were supposedly invited. And obviously we have the ongoing legacies of the Windrush scandal and things like that, which are in our everyday news but also kind of left in the background as well and I think particularly with stories of the Windrush like you've got individuals like Carmen Beckford for example those stories are meant to tell this kind of like triumphant story of the Windrush coming over helping out Britain and that's like the high mark of Britain's race relations the Windrush are meant to be these people that come over and help out and they're able to assimilate but what many people find in the cases of like Carmen Beckford um, Kelso Cochrane, which again is a, a particularly sensitive topic to teach, but it goes on and on and on throughout the 20th century and this kind of continual fight for justice, even when black people in Britain are trying their best in many different fields of life, whether it's music, sport, art, whatever it is, and around the corner there's an element of injustice that maybe they have to tackle in their lives. Yeah, and on that point, I mean, we've had the misfortune of uh, in the last five, six years, being able to witness the rewriting of the Windrush story to suit certain agendas, whilst also seeing, you know, the hollowness of the rhetoric around, you know, this being, you know, the high watermark of Britain's sort of race relations, etc. Um, just to add, I know this isn't my question, but just from what you were both saying, it just made me think that what this book does is it also just helps them contextualize Black Britain today and helps people understand what it means to be Black and British through so many different stories and you know there's not one monolithic experience of being Black and British but I think it really does a really good job of 
just looking at all the intersections of identity when yeah. it comes to Black Britain, where it's, you know, class, background, even within the Black British experience of maybe coming from the Caribbean or coming from an African um, country. And just as well as like the, the ordinary, everyday common themes that, you know, all people can relate to. I think it just helps people understand how we are here, how we, we got to this story, it just tells the story so vividly but then also just so in such a varied way um i think sometimes when you speak about black black british people you kind of sometimes see the focus is kind of put on um this is what it means to be this but i think what the book does is just complicates that and actually says well this 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 is you know these people are as varied and as complex as all people and that's again like you humanizing them but also just showing that I think the point about justice is really important to understand how racism manifests I think by showing that you know the struggle is you know in the stories of a lot of these characters helps people understand just how pernicious racism actually is and, you know, you talked about John Barnes as like an example of someone who is at the pinnacle of their profession. Equally, you know, so many, this is a story of so many of the, the, the characters in the book that despite their success, despite their, their talents, despite their gift, despite their contribution to society, this thing is always still marring their experiences. And it gives students an opportunity to interrogate race, I think, in an interesting way as well. Is that something you think has been in, lacking in, in schools up to now, the, the explicit teaching of race or at least, you know, yeah. meaningful conversations? Yeah, I think it's got a lot better in recent years. And I think we can all look at 2020 as an important turning point in the teaching of history and race. But I think there is still that tendency to perhaps want to tell black stories, but to leave out the injustice part or to only focus on the injustice part. But I think the way in which this book integrates both of those themes of the everyday, the, the ways in which black people have contributed to every facet of British society and also carried the burden of racial injustice is just done really well. And I think that complex understanding of race, which I think, you know, the nation has kind of um, not had for generations. My hope by looking at this book was that this would actually give young people a bit more of a nuanced understanding of the way in which race operates, that it's not just a, oh, this person said something really rude to me, this person did this. It's actually quite a complex and systemic and yeah, the, the legacy of it just really is just, without it being like labored and without it being like, you know, a story of woe and um, hopelessness, it was just, a story of of life and and a story of you know just real people thank you it's estelle let's <laughs> let's hear from estelle um but this is the time where people get to just say how would you go about selecting stuff for the classroom and i think it's begun you know nathaniel gave us that really nice account about the georgians and how he, he'd want to teach that um what did you I mean, having looked at some of the book, what would you pick out as being perhaps a highlight of something that you would uh, you would want to teach? Um, there are a few things, and I think they were they weren't necessarily the bits I expected to to pick out. Um, I love it. we already do stuff on the Black Tudors. I know lots of schools do things on the Black Tudors related to Miranda Kaufman's book, but actually. The thing that I think that inquiry offered in this book that I haven't seen elsewhere, and it's kind of linked to various things that Sharon was saying around complexity and, and nuance, but also the question of uncertainty. Because I feel often we, when we're talking about sources in the past and we're talking about um, finding the sources about Black British history, there's a sense that, you know, Black people have gone through this primary trauma of, you know, racism or discrimination and persecution. But then there's almost a secondary trauma of, and now, you know, you didn't keep proper records, so therefore we're not even going to write about you in history books. Um, and so this textbook, one of the, I think there's a phrase where it says, you know, we will never know for sure. It's around Mary Phyllis, and I've used Mary Phyllis in lessons before, and it says, we will never know for sure what she was doing in these um, 
couple of years. And I think that kind of language, and you look at other textbooks, other textbooks often don't use that kind of language, the language of uncertainty, the language of, um, you know, this is what the discipline of history is. We, we don't know for sure, but actually encouraging students to use their own historical imagination um, to, to fill those gaps and to say that actually the absence of those sources doesn't have to be a problem. Um, and so that I, I really enjoyed, and I've not seen that in anything else around um, looking at Mary Phyllis. Now, the, the inquiry that we do in year eight around the early modern period is um, how did early modern England become um, more connected to the world? So some of the stories in here in terms of Mary Phyllis, who we do use, but then Dedari Jacoa, who I hadn't heard of, oh, absolutely, yeah. you know, fantastic and, and gets involved in... Um, <laughs> haberdashery brought from modern day Libya and um, Liberia from this by this guy called John Davis who's a haberdasher my school is is funded by the haberdasher so obviously oh, yeah. we love anything yeah. to do with buttons and hats is you know right up our street um and then he arrives in London he, he learns English he's baptized he conducts trade in English and then when he returns to Liberia in 1619 he introduces himself under the name John Davis who is the person who who brought him to London and kind of and there's that question at the end of the the chapter um how far might the you know these two men John Blank who is taught in a lot of classrooms and Dedari Jaquoa how far might they have considered themselves black Englishmen and I just think that's such an interesting question around black identity at that um point and the other one that I didn't expect and I, I to, to kind of take as much from as I, as I did is the inquiry around Tiger Bay in Cardiff um you know again echoing something Nathaniel said around the way in which the book unites and kind of straddles this um global and local um dynamic as someone who's not from London I grew up in a in a in Lancashire in a little town in Lancashire um I often get quite annoyed by how London centric lots of textbooks are and it's almost like we kind of you know we talk a lot about race in America but we also talk about race in London and we don't often talk about race elsewhere in the UK um and I thought that inquiry around Tiger Bay and Cardiff um, w was absolutely fantastic and I thought again the ability of that chapter to link the local in Cardiff with you know it talks about um, the invention of the steamship and the acquisition of Aden and the Suez Canal and you know naval bases and, and the emergence of entrepots which my year 13s have just been tested on this morning in their final paper three and there you've got that in a key surgery textbook connected to Cardiff and I just thought that um, that kind of dynamic between local and global is, was just fantastic. Um, and, it, you know, that wasn't a chapter that I thought, you know, here I am in London, I'm from Lancashire. I'm, what can I take from a chapter about Cardiff? But just so, so much. Thank you. Um, can I just speak to that as well, Robin? Yeah, sure, sure. I, th I, th I think, I think the sales first point, I totally agree. This is not just a textbook about black British history. It's also just a textbook of history from below. Um, and it, and it, as any good history from below does, leave space for uncertainty and leave space for questions because ultimately that's what good source work will do. Um, and it's very honest in doing that. And I, I really, really would praise that for it. Um, the sources are great. I mean, there's so many great sources in there that would be well selected. There's great activities around them. Um, and I think finally that point about the site inquiries for people that haven't seen it yet. It, there are selections of site inquiries around particular places, but also there seems to be a quite clear emphasis on quite regional spaces as well within Britain. Like it, as you say, it isn't just London. It isn't even just Tar Cardiff. You know, there's mention of, of you know, quite small would now be suburban towns uh, where people end up. And I, I like to think that that was done purposefully to try and um, to try and gem well to to give every part of the UK a sense that this is their story, not just simply a, a London story. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I don't know. Maybe I'm ignorant of textbooks out there are doing this, but um, it's it's dealing with sources and it's is it, its ability to allow students to maybe even you know speculate. Dare I say, speculate after making inferences with sources is is I think really to be commended. Mm. So um, Otis, what about your so something that you would choose to use, maybe like Estelle, something that surprised you, something you weren't expecting? Um, I'd say with the book cover, um, and I don't give too many kind of like hints away as to the, the full nature of the source and its, and its content, but just looking at the, the front of the book to begin with, it's just one that completely just throws you off. You're, you're trying to work out what the relationship is between the two women in the picture, and again, when you first look at it, you might have these misconceptions. 
from understandings of or misunderstandings of how race operates and the construct of race. Um, and in selecting a particular well, the cover in that way, I think it deliberately makes people think, OK, there are questions to be asked and there are questions the whole way through the book of individuals and how we can use them. But it starts really with the first picture in terms of how blackness is perceived in particular times, but also how whiteness is as well and how the two interrelate constantly on so many different dimensions. And I think just looking at the picture, and I'm, again, I'm trying to not to give too much away, but... No, you can. It's all right. Please do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's out next week anyway. Yeah. In two individuals, again, you, you might misinterpret and you might think, well, maybe the woman is a servant and the, the picture is titled Young Woman with a Servant. Um, and well, you... it was it was only titled in America like that. It wasn't originally titled like that. And again, it's those maybe misconceptions or misunderstandings of how race is. Um, and obviously, when this was painted, um, transatlantic slavery, and it was it was fully operating, especially within the British context, American context as well. And I think the picture really just, or the source really just makes it much more complex in terms of considering how race operates. It interrupts the psyche, it interrupts the way in which you think about how race operates. Um, and it really just makes comparisons of how black people were living during different times, during the Georgian period, for example. Um, and it gives a much richer picture, I think. I think uh, as Estelle was talking about the lack of sources and how sometimes that has it hampered you know people's ability to teach black british history well i mean here you have a source and you don't have a great deal of information about it but it as you were saying there it gives you an opportunity to to reflect to, you know have a, a conversation with you know full contextual uh, understanding and and speculate you know about their relationship about the lives that they were leading i think you could spend easily a whole lesson easily a whole lesson Looking at that source, yeah. it's so rich and there's so many avenues you could take it in. Um, and secondly, actually, um, my other high point of the book is growing up in South London, um, seeing things that were close to my home. Um, so, for example, you mentioned the Brockwell Three, that was literally the road I lived off of as a child. Um, and to see kind of stories where the site is so important and for example, if you don't know where Brockwell Park is, it's in Brick it's basically Brixton slash Herne Hill in South London. And to include stories that are from across the nation, I think is so, so important. But to see kind of stories where I literally walked past that park on so many different occasions and had no idea that in the 1970s, young black boys were being targeted by the police and being arrested and that that kind of disruption. Thinking. And schoolboys going on strike to protest it. And going on strike. And then the latter with the kind of introduction of big figures like Muhammad Ali and going to different schools and stuff like that. But I'll, I'll leave that there for that. That photo, like I actually did gasp when I saw that photo because I, as well, so I felt a bit ashamed that I didn't even know that that happened. But yeah, that photo of, uh, I don't know if, again, if, if I want to leave it as a surprise, but yeah, no, that photo of Muhammad yeah. Ali. At, at Tulsa Hill Boys, um, I did not know he got he went there. Um, I really didn't know that, and that that blew my mind. There's also a photo of Bob Marley, which again yeah. I thought I'd seen all of the photos of Bob Marley in London, but apparently not. <laughs> Some great stuff in there. I like again. I can just totally imagine like that photo of Muhammad Ali using that in a lesson. You know, putting like a figure around him to be like, who could that be? Um, getting them to infer like you know what kind of event could be happening here you've got the whole of the school looking at this one person at the front um, and then you've got this great source which is not just the image but then you've got um, the governor who's reflecting upon his memory of it which you know having met some teacher governors or even some governors in my time maybe he's overemphasizing his role I don't know I don't know but he certainly... I mean, it wasn't any old governor, though. It was... No, it wasn't, exactly. <laughs> Stevenson, um, wow. Yeah, so we we could, we you know, you yeah, there's just so much. And again, this is the thing of stories that through these stories, you can thread a whole, a whole kind of, you know, this is where you build in structures. This is where you talk about factors. You know, don't get them highlighting political, economic and social before actually just getting some stories down, you know. And these are the stories that allow you to open up those questions, I think. Sharon. 
I just absolutely loved listening to you guys talking about the favorite parts of the books. I think what people are going to really enjoy, I think teachers are going to enjoy this book as well as, you know, for the students. I think for teachers, it's just really exciting. And like you were all saying, like there's just so much that we can connect with as well. Um, and I was thinking about how I would use this in our curriculum. And I just, I think, you know, the inquiries kind of stand alone they're good enough to just, you know, they're just good to go on their own. But then there's also pieces that you can use in other inquiries as well. And um, I think the sources, like, you know, Nathaniel was talking about the photographs that are in this book are incredible in just the richness of them, the way in which you can use them, the questions that you've got to interrogate them with. It's almost like a resource book as well as just a textbook for teachers. I think it's a great resource. Um, and I think one thing that I've always struggled with is Black History Month. And one thing I have a problem with Black History Month, it just seems to be like a free for all of anything black. Let's just put it in October. Let's look at scientists. Let's look at music. Let's look at everything. And it seems to sometimes lacks coherence. Um, and so what I want to do in, in our um, school is have a Black History Month curriculum where every year we've got like a specific focus and a specific theme and we're building not only our students understanding of black britain and black history but also our our, our our wider school community our staff and our teachers i think black history month is a really good opportunity for everyone to learn and i just thought wouldn't it be great to just do one of these inquiries with the whole school across black history month so i was really intrigued by the music inquiry and I just really love the, the the simplicity of the question, but just also how much richness the book, um, the content in the book kind of yields to kind of answering it ultimately. And it's how did black people help to shape music in Britain from 1500 to the present day? And it's like you're looking at 500 plus years of history through the lens of music. And I thought what would be great about the, this inquiry through a Black History Month is the resources are the music, the sound, which is incredible. Um, I really, really like the activities as well. I think sometimes textbook activities can just be a bit like, really, like, do you really want me to create a puzzle now with my year, with my year eights? And they're just a bit, a bit superficial and not really realistic in terms of like the integrity of like historical analysis and historical thinking. But I really like the idea of like interrogating lyrics and thinking about how you would contextualize lyrics. Um, and the activity that you've got with um, Shirley Bassey and um, Paul Robeson and the connection that the Manic Street Preachers made with those two um, artists from Cardiff was really really interesting I think the idea that you know Otis kind of talked about the front cover of the book and the importance of not may maybe making assumptions about the, the connection between white and black people in Britain and I think you know a, for a band like the Manic Street Preachers to also have a take on black British lives is really really interesting and important and I guess, you know, most of our students might not necessarily know who the Manic Street Preachers are, let alone Paul Robeson and Shirley Bassey, but I think the newness of it as well, but then the connection that maybe teachers might make with that is really, really interesting. So yeah, just the, the activities, I think, and the, the thought that's gone into creating something that is still does justice to the discipline of history at Key Stage 3, I think is really important. So yeah, I'm excited to, to plan um, Black History Month with that specific focus of music in that um, live and it just reading the chapter made me think about um, Stormzy's um, Mel Made Me Do It and the video and the visual of that because it is a story of like Black British history and you've almost got an inquiry that goes with that 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 song which is so iconic now and young people will identify with it but maybe they might not understand why the choices um, the director made in you know creating that story and that legacy they've actually got like a real history to um to 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 put a foundation to that piece of art too so yeah mm, wow so much to so much to talk about um but here's a question for estelle and sharon 
um, start with Estelle. So a lot of some people in the past have said, well, mm. I, I don't do black history in my school because we don't have many black students. Um, in fact, Abdul and I are going to be talking in a couple of weeks at a, at a, at a conference about black history in white spaces. Um, what do you, what would you say? Is black British history only suitable for multi-ethnic classrooms? What would be your take, Estelle, on that? I mean, the short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is, I think it is, it's a real underestimation of, of what students can do. Um, and I think we, we're not doing black British history. We're not, we're not learning through black British history out of some kind of inherent requirement to teach a diverse past that's tokenistic we're doing it because it's more re representative of what the past actually looked like um you know learning about black british history is better history full stop learning about the chartists and learning about william cuffey is better history about the chartists um and i think we've you know i don't i don't tend to use the phrase diverse i tend to talk about more representative history because it is about you know changing the way that students think about um you know, think about the past. You know, if you say a, a worker, a student will, you know, unfortunately tend to think some um, a white male worker with a hammer and, um, you know, spanner, whatever it happens to be, that is not representative of what most workers in the past have looked like ever. Um, and so for me, this isn't, um, you know, this is not diversity for the sake of diversity. This is because it's better better history overall. It improves historical reasoning. As soon as we started introducing people like Cuffey into the curriculum, um, people like Robert Wedderburn, I mean, it's amazing chapter, the Robert Wedderburn stuff in the book. I remember when we did the, teach, the teacher's fellowship a few years ago, and there's a reading about Wedderburn, and there was only one article on the internet about him, basically, and here he is now in a textbook, which is fantastic. Um, but teaching these people and teaching their intersectional identities is just better history and we saw this instantly as soon as we started teaching it and then we taught a course on the Russian Revolution and we introduced things um, around black communists in the Russian Revolution and the kind of influence of, of black Marxism in the 1920s students suddenly went oh, okay when we're talking about Russian workers we're not just talking about white male workers we're talking about women we're talking about people from the Caucasus we're talking about peasants we're talking you know there is not this discrete category of worker who looks a certain way um, so there's that. But I think the other thing I would say is someone who did, you know, grow up outside of London and did grow up in, in potentially the kind of classroom that someone would look at and say, this is not a multi-ethnic classroom. Actually, you don't you don't know the backgrounds of the students in front of you. When I was growing up, when I was at school, the British National Party, the BMP, were making massive gains around where I grew up. Um, and I remember a student who I was really close friends with coming in one day and saying, my dad's going to vote BMP, but my auntie's Nigerian. So you don't, you simply do not know the backgrounds of the students in front of you. Um, yeah, so I think those kind of two things. For me, it's not about um, black British history for the sake of it. It's better history. It's, it teaches better historical reasoning. But also we need to be careful not to be making assumptions about um, the students in front of us. Yeah, I would totally agree, Estelle, that um, sometimes we think we know what the background and identity of students are but it always surprises you when you hear about their stories um and and that makes sense right like it makes sense that given that britain has had such a dynamic impact on global history that people's stories no matter how they might present are going to be quite varied and quite complex um, and i think you know black british history isn't just about you know Doing, doing black British history, like you said, Estelle, for the sake of it, but actually telling a richer history, doing justice to the discipline of history is really important. But I also think it's really important that in classrooms that aren't maybe as, you know, diverse as, you know, inner city, in, inner city London classrooms, like, you know, the school I teaching, I think it's even more important to do these kinds of histories, because I think whilst you know, young people might not be going to schools with people who look different to them necessarily. They are living in a, a hyper global world, whether that's through social media, through TV, TV, that almost sounds like an anachronism now. Um, <laughs> online, you know, they are actually more connected with people who come from all over the world in ways that, you know, we just never were. And I think it's important for them to understand people. It's also important for them to understand, you know, the, who who 
who the people are that they see in their world, despite them not being in their school, they're still very present in their lives through sport, through music, through culture, through all sorts of um, influences. I think whilst they might live in those spaces politically, you know, you talked about, you know, a student talking about the BNP in their local area. These kind of stories can help them contextualize that that narrative as well. Can help them contextualize that that those those politics. So I think whilst we might say, you know, some people might say it's not relevant to students who don't live in diverse areas or go to school with diverse people. Um, we don't just teach histories of the people who look like us. You know, I think this is a conversation we've had many a time. You know, we don't. How many students can say, "Yep, yeah, they they come from a." a European background but will happily teach you know lots of history that are actually quite European like we don't we don't quibble when it comes to other histories and other parts of 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 the world we don't say we are but we don't have any students from France why are we teaching the French Revolution you know that doesn't seem to be an issue but why is it when it comes to black history it's a question of oh should we be doing that um but I think it also that stems from fear the fear that black history actually uncovers a lot and actually tells a truer history that people realize by uncovering these histories there's going to be something to contest with there's going to be something to reckon with Mm -hmm. and it's the fear of not being ready to reckon with those stories with those histories that makes people say but should we be and I think by presenting history in a way that is true and a way that is engaging and interesting it helps remove that fear a little bit that actually this is this is real this is live but it's also just quite normal um and it's also quite um it's 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 teaching us you know it's teaching us about why race has become such a a crucial um issue in our society in britain and globally it's telling those stories and then in, an, in a way that is accessible to students and in a way that removes that question of why should we be, um, so, yeah. Uh, can I just respond to that? I think I think to, to kind of echo Sharon's point, I think there is no such thing as a, <laughs> I, just there isn't a, a one culture classroom. No one teaches in that in the UK, either literally or just within the kind of mediated images that our students are dealing with race exists and multiple ethnicities and races exist within our students worlds um, wherever they're teaching whether it's in the most northern or most southern parts of the UK Um, so giving them the way to understand that is exactly what our role as teachers is um, to understand the world they live in and I think to, to build on that if there are teachers out there who are feeling uncomfortable or if there's people listening here who are ahead of department who are interested in this stuff but feel like there's teachers in their department that wouldn't quite be able to deal with some of the questions that might pop up I think this textbook is a bit of a yeah I would say a bit scaffolding for that for those members of the department you may feel uncomfortable with that that it might support teachers to do this better rather than just simply students to understand it more there's some really really thoughtful pieces I mean I'm uh, I'm such a uh what's the word I do this worse than anyone else I skip through the first few pages of the textbook when I've got it if I need to use it because I want to get straight into like the content because lord knows that I've got only five lessons before you know half term or whatever but actually the first few pages are really well thought out really considerately written and will guide I mean I, I personally think a really good department meeting would be to go through those first few pages with your department read through it together and say well why have they written this? Uh, do we do this? Is this something that we already do in our practice? Is this something we could adapt or use? Could we use this image in some way? Um, I think, yeah, I think this textbook is is there not just for the students, but as I think as Sharon has already mentioned, it's there for us as teachers as well. Final question? Okay. Yeah, we're on to our final question. Uh, uh, I suppose we'll leave this open to everyone, but uh, starting with Otis. Um, Should we uh, avoid talking about racism uh, in the stories we teach about black British history? In short, again, no, we have to we have to contend with race. And I I think the classroom in particular has to be a safe place, a place in which is 
cultivated by the teacher and students feel that they are supported in talking about issues that are connected to race. The, the, the talk about race is everywhere in terms of like national news, in terms of like the students seeing the England team and individuals like Raheem Sterling and Bakayo Saka getting all the stick after the Euros and things like that and the World Cup, for example. So these are things that students have in the back of their minds. And speaking about race in a classroom, it just needs to be, it needs, a teacher needs to ensure that dialogue is at the center of it. And to really ensure that individuals are supported in the exploration of how race and racism has developed over time. And that can only be done through careful consideration in terms of planning a curriculum. And I think this textbook can greatly help that. And I'd echo definitely what Nathaniel was saying about the first few pages are so important. And I'd even be tempted to show that to my students in thinking about why, why is this textbook even relevant? Why is it even being published? And it's an important thing to, to reckon with in our classrooms that these issues have been ignored, they have been sidelined, or they might have been warped or distorted in some ways. And that the classroom is a place where everyone should be able to kind of develop their thinking about what race means, especially in Britain in the 21st century. I think uh, you, you were saying, Sharon, that you were going to be using some of these inquiries for your sort of Black History Month celebrations, the first Black History Month in 87, and then really right up to quite recently, they did focus pretty much exclusively on positive achievements. Mm -hmm. And there was some thinking behind that. And that was because there had been this sort of these decades, centuries of negative mm -hmm. portrayals of Black mm -hmm. people and that to sort of explore anything other than pure, you know, uh, untarnished figures would be uh, harmful. Uh, uh, do, you, do you all think that we're, we're past that point? I think we're clearly not past that point. I think maybe the impact of, you know, that that kind of view of Black history of just being about these heroes and these, these stories has maybe made this era and this time a bit more challenging for people because if the history that they've been presented with is, oh, look at these people who've done wonderful things and have contributed, then it's almost like, well, what is the problem with race? Where did this all come from? So I think a book like this that does both, that, you know, interrogates the injustice of race and the inescapable fact of, you know, racism and the way in which it, it you know, it colours the experience of people's lives, back and white, by having that, as well as seeing the, the ordinary everydayness of the people, as well as seeing the exceptional um, qualities of the people, gives just a richer view of the Black British experience. But I think to ignore the reality of racism and the reality of race would, it, that's a distortion of history. It's just not even historically accurate to be able to do that. You cannot really tell the story of Black Britain without telling the story of transatlantic slavery, the legacy of race, the construction of race, of empire, of um, you know, racism in modern times. You can't really do that. You can't have one without the other. I think you just, you have to have both. And the way in which this book does that in a rigorous and engaging and intriguing way is just you know, really exceptional. I think it's been interesting like hearing you know from both of you talk about the book but then seeing it come together I said to Robin yesterday it was just mind-blowing because it's not your average key stage three textbook I think anyone that gets their hands on this thinking you know it clearly says key stage three history but it's not the same motif as other key stage three history books it's just done with such care and such um, historical rigour that often key stage three books lack that it just really is exceptional and again like Nathaniel said I'm not even being paid to say this it genuinely is <laughs> such a great textbook and just for teachers as well you know before putting it in front of students I think just spending time with it ourselves just is so much food for thought and is gonna yeah really shape the way in which we think about not just um this history but just the discipline of history as well that's what I've kind of taken from it so far so can, can I share a quick anecdote on that 
very mm -hmm. quick, I promise. Yes, please. I'm now, I'm now at a new school, so I can share this, but I will obviously keep it anonymous. Um, <laughs> uh, a, a senior member of a previous member of uh, the staff body that I was included in. Uh, once in, in and around 2020, we were discussing around um, protests and uh, BLM protests in the UK. And he recalled to me, um, or, or she, uh, recalled to me the, the surprise at seeing a banner that said Britain had created racism and in fact uh, was kind of almost laughing at the idea. Now, I don't think this textbook claims that Britain created racism at all, but the fact that that was such a laughable idea to him, I think, belied the idea that for him, race was this kind of, and racism was this ahistorical concept that existed throughout time and there wasn't a historical specificity to it, that it hadn't been something that had been generated and and regenerated through historical processes. This person who, you know, was a very, very senior and intelligent person, um, just didn't have a historical understanding of race. Um, and so the idea that a 16 year old was claiming that Britain had a role in creating race was laughable to me. And I think that probably speaks to what Sharon is saying. This textbook isn't sadly just for our students. This is a textbook that hopefully will educate the, the wider student and staff body as well, because I hope in five years time, I wouldn't have to have that kind of conversation again uh, with a senior member of staff. Estelle, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I think the thing that really struck me around this, about this question around, should we just focus on positive achievements is I think, we really run the risk of, of perpetuating the kind of the narrative of good migrant and bad migrant. You don't have to come here and, you know, be an amazing footballer or write amazing books to be in receipt of rights. You you know, if you come here and for whatever reasons you end up re resorting to petty theft, as, as various people in the books do, that that should mean you're in exactly the same receipt of rights as anyone else in this country. Um, and I think the, I mean, my current obsession is, is Mansa Musa and the kind of, various critiques of him in the way he's he is taught in British schools at the moment but that's that's a separate issue but I think that the thing that really comes out of every single inquiry in the book is the complexity of these characters and they don't fit um you know a kind of white narrative of, of linear progress of dealing with issues to do with race and they don't fit that because that's not what history was um and so you know if you're if you want students to get the idea that legacies are not facts, legacies are arguments about the past. When we talk about what's the legacy of slavery today, that's an argument that we're having in this current political moment. The book you know, could not be better at getting across that, that crucial point. The legacies are arguments. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm so excited to use it in the classroom because I just think in terms of marrying content and context and um, you know, the discipline of history itself and, and what that is, I haven't yet seen a better textbook. Thank you, Estelle. Um, I want one thing I just very quickly that I wanted to, to say something that surprised me in the process of put collating this together and writing it was actually you talked about ordin order ordinariness. Um, it's the ordinariness of mixed race relationships in Britain for hundreds of years. Um, so many of the people are in in the book are actually of dual heritage um it's kind of like you know not only is black british history british history but also it's dual heritage history there there are white there are white people in this book there are there are husbands and wives mothers and and there that was really interesting um i think for me the most kind of like yeah the most sort of new thing was the Liverpool site study where almost every family in that in that study is is of dual heritage they're they're mixed heritage um and that was quite exciting for me to to realize that you know because it's I mean it's also got that that chapter's also got some very dark stuff about what academics were saying about dual heritage uh young people and I think that's a side of of British history that should be uh, considered. But uh, yeah, I, I, I love that aspect. I don't know if, it, if that struck anybody else. Anyone want to chip in briefly? Yeah, there's a, there's a great um, 
oh, I've written it down somewhere. Yeah, Dudley Thompson from Jamaica, um, who was applying to be in the RAF, um, goes to this RAF recruitment um, recruitment, you know, situation fair, um, and they say to him, "Are you a, are you of pure European descent?" Mm. And on the RAF form, he writes yes. <laughs> um and then the recruiting officer you know challenges him on it and says I, I don't think you are um and he says fine I'll do a blood test if you don't believe me and they kind of give up and let him join and I just think that again that ordinariness you can imagine um you know someone's annoyance on that day and then the recruiting officer and that kind of thing I just loved about the book uh, oh. the end of our time um but we, we uh, no no We've got some no, time left. Now. I just wanted to ask one question of you guys, which was um, you started writing this book maybe what, three years ago, two years ago? Uh, a lot. Yeah, it was about a year. No, it's actually only a year, a, year ago, a year and a half. It was, we started planning it February 2022. And, and did, did, uh, did what was happening in the world at the time impact the way you were writing it at all? And if so, how? Ooh. Um, sorry about that uh, no 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 it's it's an important question um i don't think um i don't think this would have been possible um without the events of 2020 um it's not to say that that moment was necessarily at the forefront of our minds but the i think we were confident when we were writing that our audience would be much more receptive to the kind of history we wanted to tell as a result of those uh, sort of a global shift in interest. Um, I wouldn't say attitudes, you know, because that's that's quite a leap, but there was definitely that shift and, and, and that gave us the confidence to write the sort of history we wanted to write, which was, you know, just ordinary people getting about their lives and also happening to be involved in extraordinary events every now and then. Um, so, yeah, I, I, um, I think, and, and and some of the sort of the discourse around mi migration to, to Britain, the Windrush betrayal, these were things which were were were, were at the forefront of our minds. I think is that yeah. fair to say, Robin? Yeah, I think the other thing is that it it was clear that this is this was a book that people would be prepared to go with, and therefore we had to make it really special, and we we kind of replanned it after about four months because we were originally just going to go for a kind of 16th century and then the 17th century and then this and this and a kind of just totally chronological approach and then we realized that that wasn't good enough it wasn't innovative enough and that's where the site studies came from so we we were originally only going to have the cardiff site study and then we decided that it was so important for that sense of place and ordinariness that is that seems to be coming up a lot in this uh, in this session um and that the site study i think did that um just this idea and it comes actually from um somebody just talking uh, a few months ago that you know the idea that like otis was saying this is this is history about a place that you might have just walked through you know you might have walked past it um Railton Road, you know, in, in Brixton, you might have walked down Railton Road. Did you know all of this? And I think that's what the, the maps were kind of important for that to actually show if you wanted to go there, you know, take a trip and here's what you could actually go to the place. Um, it might be something completely different now, but, you know, on that spot, there's something kind of visceral, isn't there, about standing on a place and thinking, you know, William Cuffey stood here on Kennington Common and had beef with the Fergus O'Connor or whatever. It's just, it's, there's something really important about that. I think that's something we, that we changed that, that really transformed the book, I think. Any other questions from you? <laughs> I guess my question is, how would you hope the book would be used in schools? Like, what is your hope for the for the book? Um, I, I would hope that, you know, um, that every teacher has a chance to read it um, and be inspired by it. You know, the, 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 get a sense of because um, we, we, we spent a lot of time, you know, researching these individuals 
you know, being a, having been a teacher, um, time is a very valuable commodity. So you have two people who have spent the time researching these individuals, these places, these sort of issues. Um, and so, yeah, if, even if you are going to go off and plan your own uh, inquiries, which you know people yeah, enjoy doing, uh, I, I would I would just like for every teacher to have a chance to, to have a read through uh, of the book. But that might be asking a lot. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to see them teach the stories. It's quite I mean, I think we're at a not only in terms of black British history and, you know, post 2020 and the political moment, but actually pedagogical moment. I think a lot of history teachers are talking about the importance of stories um which should never have gone away really but that is there and i hope they teach the whole story i hope they don't like turn it into some bullets they i i, I want them to tell that like, that one of the favorite people for me are, are the young family i mean there's the tragedy in cardiff the young family in cardiff the tragedy of that family you know three men in that family die in the second world war um that young the young guy arthur i mean you know he gets married he loves jazz music and he dies in an aircraft that develops a fault and crashes in liverpool um and yet the, the daughter patty she spends decades to get a memorial that would not just be her family but would include her family and and she does it and I just think that that spread on the young family, I, that's one of my favourites. I just love that. And I hope people, I hope teachers will just teach the stories. And yeah, and, and also start to teach more of the 19th century, you know, the, these sort of, you know, the working class history. I think that's come up quite a few times. That's something that's been missing from school curricula and including the stories of of, of the black, you know, lives that we've included as 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 part of that. That would be a, a sort of a, a really encouraging change that you know, I'd like to see. Mm. Um, um, I think we come to the end of the hour, but uh, um, I don't know if there were any, if there were going to be questions coming through. I'm not sure. Uh, none have come through. Um, oh, okay. We have a question uh, from Eleanor Nicholson. Uh, I read an article by Tomiwa Owalade this week based on his new book, This is not America subtitled Why Black Lives in Britain Matter. And it particularly struck me because a lot of my students are very familiar with African-American experiences and transfer them to Britain. And unpicking this proves tricky. So thank you for producing a textbook that will be incredibly valuable. Ah, thank so, you very much. Uh, thank uh, you, Eleanor. And I do, the, the point that we were making about mixed race relationships and dual heritage people that's i think something that makes britain quite distinct from the american it's in america that's far less common um and that's that's a richness about black british history that i think is really worth worth a, a distinctiveness studying. yeah and i think yeah. eleanor's comment uh, actually reflects a frustration that a lot of us have had with the teaching of of, of black history this you know this creating this amalgamation of caribbean british and american uh, experiences and just saying well it's it's all the same really isn't it um and I, I think making black british history distinct and 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 shining a light on its sort of unique aspects and features i think is a really important um uh, aim of this book All right. Okay. I think we've come to a natural end. Um, can we just say uh, an enormous thank you to Sharon, Nathaniel, Estelle and Otis for your incredibly insightful uh, comments and, 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 and thoughts on, 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 on the book. Um, I'm sure lots of teachers will, will value what you've had to say as we have. Um, and so thank you for your time. And, and yeah, thank you to Hoda for hosting uh, us. Um, and yeah, uh, we hope really people really enjoy the book when it's out in a week.